We just saw that video from those Spanish tuna fishermen. And those guys were essentially doing what you saw in the video, what they've been doing for a long, long time. One of the neat things about uh, our exploitation of things, we, we mentioned whales, you guys saw the whales in, in that lecture here with fish, is that because because we've, we've had this long interaction with these resources, and oftentimes those interactions happen with a city, a government, some type of company. People are interested in keeping track of stuff, so we actually have access to some, some unique records that we might not have with, with, let's say, the snail darter in the river or something. So in this case, uh, this is some work from a colleague who used to be at Scripps and now is at... Um, National Geographic, Enrique Sala, but, but so what he worked on is he um, went to these Spanish towns, in this case, two different Spanish towns, and actually went back into their old records and check it out, the records from about uh, the 1500s to uh, before the American Revolution, and he went and he essentially wrote down the numbers. So in this case, a bit different than I just explained to you, these actually are the number of of whole fish. So this is the number of individual. Very rare to get this quality of data this back in time. But nevertheless, that's what he did and that's what's being displayed here. This is again these Spanish fishermen that are using these essentially pen traps. They, they're sort of corralling the, the tuna go in as they're doing these the seasonal migrations. They, they get corralled and they go into this area and then, oh my gosh, I'm trapped and they close the door. And then these guys use brute strength to manually pull up the nets shallower and shallower and shallower until the fish are basically at the surface. And they use a gaffing hook and they go and hook the guys, bring them on board and kill them. And, and that's how they get their tuna. Um, essentially unchanged for uh, th you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's cool because we're using the standard, a standardized method to do that. right? So here we go. So what do you see? Right, you see the same exact pattern that we saw with our abalone in California and the other stuff, right? Back in the day, there was a lot, and now there is less. So you saw that fisherman in the clip say, which is part of a larger story, but basically these, these um, factory ships are basically taking their toll on the fish stocks, and they clearly are. But there were no factory trawlers between 1550 and 1600, right? And yet, the numbers have gone way down. With only this data to go by, we don't know, was there some climactic thing? Was there some ecological thing that, that reduced the number of fish? But there's this pattern of taking a lot back in the day, not taking as much now. And so this, this pattern, I would suggest to you, of what we might consider to be overfishing, taking too many fish from the population or the stock, which is the group, the group of fish in a certain area, um, uh, th then they can replenish themselves, right? So um, this notion of overfishing, we might use the term, or overharvesting, appears to be commonplace. We saw those examples from other parts of the world. We saw the example from California. Here's an example from Spain going back hundreds of years. So it's starting to look like a consistent pattern. And when we look, and over the last couple of decades, we've looked harder and harder, we find more and more and more evidence of this kind of stuff, what we might call historical overfishing. Something that didn't just start in the 70s, didn't just start in the 80s, didn't just start in the 60s, but uh, for longer time periods. So let's, let's take a slightly deeper temporal look at this historic state. So this is a really cool paper um, I'll have you guys read. This is um, a paper from Science about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago. And these folks uh, picked one particular focal ecosystem that's relatively distinct, so they could, they could narrow in some of their efforts. And they try to see how has this ecosystem changed. The ecosystem in, in uh, particular they were curious to explore um, was coral reef ecosystem. What was the coral reef ecosystem? 
And so they wanted to take an approach that used a lot of different academic disciplines, something that we might do here at Channel Islands. So they had anthropologists, they had geologists, they had ecologists, they had uh, historians, they had all, all a bunch of different folks. And so they looked at uh, 14 different regions and they picked seven different times. I'll, I'll explain those in a second. And then they looked at, because they were looking over long time periods and, and different areas of the world, they chose to look at guilds or groups of critters that um, do some function similarly. Grazers, herbivores, primary producers, stuff like that, rather than an individual species per se. Because that species might be different in the Caribbean versus uh, the South Pacific or something. And, and the overall question they, they simply wanted to ask in this 2003 study was, um, have these reefs changed? And if they have, how have they changed? Here are the places where they were working. So a lot were in the Caribbean, in the, in the Western Atlantic. They had some sites in the Red Sea. And they had sites around the South Pacific and around Australia. So that's their geographic uh, area of data collection. Then they looked at uh, seven different time periods. Now these are, these are defined operationally. So here are these seven time periods. One was the so-called pre-human influence period. And this, this was basically about 40,000 years ago. The YBP is year bef years before present. So 40,000 years ago to 1503. And, and th these will vary slightly depending on where we are in the world. But we have this pre-human influence. And then we have the initial human influence, with the, which these guys refer to as the hunter-gatherer period. And that, uh, depending on the area that we're talking about, extended as, as, continued as late as the early 1800s. Then we had the period where agriculture dominates our human, our, our, our caloric intake, that we're getting a lot of our food from agricultural sources. Next is a colonial occupational uh, phase, which is where uh, European powers are, are first getting to an area and establishing political and military and cultural control. And then once they've established that control and, and the colony is, is functioning, by definition, these colonies were established well, for a variety of reasons. But for, in the context of our coastal marine management class, you can think of these colonies as being established to attract resources back to the, the empire's core, back to the uh, originator's homeland, right? So they want to pull back stuff to make clothes. They want to pull back stuff to make money. They want to pull back stuff to sell, tobacco, sugar, whatever it is. And so that period where that, that modern commerce is starting would be referred to as the colonial development period. And then they have the modern era broken up into two, two, two breakpoints, which we'll see this again and again, the pre-World War II time period and the post-World War II time period. Primarily because World War II wars do all kinds of crazy things, one of which, as much as we might regret this or, or wish it weren't the case, wars are fantastic innovators of technological um, advances, right? So we invent all kinds of crazy new ways to slaughter each other, invent new technology to do that, and then after the war, those technologies usually have all kinds of benefits. Uh, antibacterial drugs, um, uh, things that explode in different ways, sonar, all, all, all that kind of stuff. And so, so uh, we usually break the modern period into the pre-World War II and the post-World War II, and that's what they did here. Cool? So we have these seven time periods. Again, these time periods might be slightly different depending on the different geographic regions. They're going to use these seven time periods, though, as opposed to using dates per se. They're going to use you know time period one, time period two, time period three. Here are the guilds of critters that they looked at. There are large carnivores was the first guild. Things like big-bodied sharks, and then small carnivores, smaller guys. Uh, that uh, were more like 
the size of you or smaller. And then similarly, large herbivores, big grazers, and small herbivores, small grazers. And then what they referred to as the architects of the coral reef, the things that created the structure of the reef. So first and foremost, that's coral through their calcium carbonate skeleton, creating the, the basic architecture of most reefs, but also seagrasses. Seagrasses are really important. Some, yeah, I'll just say that. Okay, so seagrasses. And then uh, suspension feeders that can um, affect the uh, suspended material um, and our filter feeders and our, our pulling stuff out of the water column. So they have those seven guilds. They, cre they created various bins for the condition of their ecosystem. So this will run on to, uh, this is more than one slide. It, it's, it was too hard to try to fit it all in one slide. So first and foremost, we have the pristine condition. And that would be places where we have detailed historical records that show that uh, there doesn't appear to be any human messing with the system. So a classic example of this would be taking a core down into, because since these coral reefs are being la laid down as, and it's a continuous living uh, structure, right? Only the topmost layer is alive, the rest is dead calcium carbonate skeleton. And so as these coral heads and, and coral fields grow, we're growing on top of the dead dude. So if you go through and if you core into that with, say, a, a rock core, you can go back through time and you can actually look at, for example, what the skeletal structure of the historic coral were. And so from that, we could say, oh, was it the same type of coral? Was it non-coral? What was the deal? So we can, we can uh, figure out if something is pristine, for example. We, then the next... Uh, phase would be something where that particular guild, that particular group of critters was abundant or common. So there, there will be human activity in, going on here. So evidence of human activity, but no real evidence of humans radically changing the, the relative abundance of the guilds. So one example of this would be we went to an area where people throw their garbage, their middens, and we look at, let's say, the vertebra of the back, from the backbones of these fish. And we look, and the ones that were you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old are the same size as they are now, let's say. So we would say, ah, we've not changed the size of the fish that we had. Also, the relative abundance of the fish bones, say, to other substances in the midden, maybe wouldn't change. So that would be evidence that, ah, these, these numbers haven't changed. Uh, then the next phase is the era of depleted or relatively uncommon abundance of these critters. So this is the period where humans are, uh, hu human use is evident and we're driving down the amount of these, uh, these organisms. And so that could be either measured by the gross number the size, like we were talking about the size of uh, body parts, or the estimated biomass of the critters on the reef. And so this, the example here would be maybe those backbones are still present, but they're shifting to smaller and smaller sized backbones, suggesting that people are eating smaller and smaller sized fish. Next, we get into the, the era of rarity. And that's where humans are, are using the, the reef. And um, we've had some significant impact on the abundance of these guilds. So that might be back in the day, we had this fish across this whole, air, whole region. Everybody had this fish on the reef. Now, we maybe only have the fish in a few, on a few, off of a few islands, let's say. Or some other uh, some other measure. The next phase that these organisms are ecologically extinct, meaning that they're still present, but they're so rare they probably have virtually no um, ecosystem functions or, or no effective ecosystem functions because it's just too um, things are too whacked, right? Too rare 
that yes, you might see this critter if you're swimming across the reef for hours and hours on end, but you're gonna see one. Whereas maybe back in the day, we used to see schools of hundreds and hundreds of these critters. Uh, and so an example, that would be something like turtles. So turtles, when the first European colonists were getting to the Caribbean, they would describe turtles so thick you could walk from islet to islet on the backs of turtles. Some of that might be exaggeration, but clearly the abundance of turtles was massively different from now. Turtles were maybe like the buffalo. They would so massively graze seagrass beds that it's, at least in some areas, unlikely that seagrass ever got above a nub stage. It was probably like looking at a golf course or something, right? Everything was mowed down by these turtle grazing, this turtle grazing. Now, it's certainly not that way. We, of course, we have turtles still, but they're comparatively rare. And in the case of, of some areas, they're ecologically extinct. They're so rare as to exert almost no influence on our coral reef. And then the, uh, obviously the last stage would be if we just completely drove the critter extinct and they're no longer, uh, no longer anywhere on the planet. Okay, so here's what they found. So this is the, this is the take home figure from their paper. So I'll orient this to you. So here we go. So red is ecologically extinct ranging up to blue, which is the pristine condition, the you know, very abundant, ubiquitous uh, thing. Here we have large carnivores, large herbivores, excuse me, large carnivores, small, etc. And here we're going from that prehistoric time to, to the post-World War II era. Everybody with me? So now, again, these time, this time and the, is a little bit different depending on where we are in the world, but we've standardized this. Okay, we've used a standardized method. So this is now a fair representation of history, right? Looking back in time. And what do we see? Oh my gosh, surprise, surprise. We see the same thing we saw with the other stuff. We started off on the left, everything, the abundance of coral, suspension feeder, small herbivore, whatever, um, was, was quite abundant back in the day. And all of them are much rarer now. Some of them, in the case of large herbivores, are ecologically extinct. But all of them are uh, severely depleted. Only a few cases of seagrass, a few cases of suspension feeders, um, only a, a small fraction of our coral reef systems have abundance of those critters, which we might describe as pristine. Everything else is either somewhat degraded or severely degraded. You guys with me? So again, when someone says, why are you trying to institute all of these management efforts or why are you trying to mess with stuff? Me mess with stuff? No. We have been messing with stuff for quite some time. So here's a quote from this paper. So large animals declined before small animals and architectural species and Atlantic reefs declined before reefs in the Red Sea in Australia. But here's the key thing, but the trajectories of decline were markedly similar worldwide. So we sometimes get lost in the forest. We sometimes say, well, this is a cedar tree, this is a pine tree, this is a manzanita shrub, this is this or that. It's different. It's different, right? But what's becoming clearer and clearer is that our historic impact in terms of over-harvesting actually appears to be similar in all these different systems with all these different settings, that we seem to be following a similar pattern. So again, Overfishing is common in stocks that we're trying to harvest. There's a lot of historical evidence for overfishing. And a new point that's starting to emerge, and we'll look at this next, ecosystem collapse may be being preceded by overfishing. So here's another, story. Here's another uh, important paper you guys will look at. This is uh, Jeremy Jackson et al. 
um, another one of these large sort of multidisciplinary lots of author explorations. And so um, his quote from this study is, overfishing precedes all other pervasive human disturbance to coastal ecosystems, including pollution, including deg degradation of water quality and anthropogenic climate change, all this stuff. So his, he and his colleagues have postulated that overfishing is the start of the problem. There's, all, there's of course, other stuff going, pollution, other challenges, but, but it's, he suggests it starts with over harvesting. So when we talk about evidence for this, this notion of, of a collapsed ecosystem, we can look at a lot of different sources of information. We can look at paleoecological stuff. We look, can look at archeological stuff. We could look at more modern historical records. We could look at ecological trends that you and I as scientists have pulled together. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to look at this. We can look at a, a variety of exploited ecosystems. We don't have to only focus on coral reefs. We could talk about kelp forests. We could talk about seagrass beds. We could talk about um, coastal estuaries. We could talk about the communities on our coastal shelves. This is the pattern, though, that we've seen. In the case of coral reefs, humans tweak the system, have some disturbance. Maybe that's over harvesting. Maybe that's having an oil spill, whatever the case may be. But we have a disturbance. That disturbance leads to a shift in relative abundance of the ecological members of that ecosystem. And then that leads to declining reefs. So we go from something like on the left here for, with a relatively uh, uh, abundant fish community and lots of coral to the stuff on the right. The stuff on the right is basically dead. What's there is macroalgae. So I studied algae for my PhD, so that's interesting to me. But probably most of you guys wouldn't find that all that interesting, right? The coral is either dead or smothered. There's not that many fish swimming around and on and on. So here's what we think happened with coral reefs. We, we first attacked the large herbivores. Either attacked them by over harvesting or in some cases maybe had some disease spread or whatever. But basically we took out those herbivores because mostly they taste good. They're tasty. Gazuntek. So we take out the large herbivores and then the, the, this situation here, the macroalgae on the right, that didn't suddenly come from Mars. Macroalgae is a natural part of this coral reef ecosystem. It's just that in a healthy system, there's so many herbivores, they're munching that stuff to death. So that stuff never gets to be abundant. It never gets to the density where it commonly overgrows coral reef heads. But now when we take those herbivores out, now the macroalgae go up and we tend to get increases in sedimentation and nutrients from other activities going on in the um, coastal zone. And then we see a decline in, in reefs. That's what we saw, for example, in the Western Atlantic. We can also, another thing is we can see a spread of disease, for example. We can see um, a decline in starfish predators. And so in this case, crown of thorn predators, which are a type of uh, sea star that eats coral, that kills coral, that, that, that kills the living part of the tissue of the coral reef. So as we, as, as we lose the predators of those guys, same thing. Sedimentation goes up, um, and, and ultimately, we start losing the Great Barrier Reef. So the survey that came out last year was that we've lost about a third of our, our coral reefs in the Great Barrier Reef. So Great Barrier Reef, a great place for you guys to go check out on vacation, because unfortunately, the trajectory that we're on right now is not a super robust, healthy Great Barrier Reef in the future. So we went from something like this. On the left is a food web uh, of, uh, of a intact coral reef. And so check it out. What do we see? We see birds. We see sharks. We see monk seals. Maybe even some saltwater crocodiles. Right? And we have all these things. And so you read these arrows as where the energy flows. Right? So, or, or, or who's eating who? So, this, so these sharks eat the grazing fish, and the more direct that this, this in ecological interaction, the thicker the line. So sharks occasionally eat a bird, 
but that's not that common. And so the line there is thinner. You guys with me? So this is the historic condition. This is our current condition. So what's, what's the difference? Well, well, one, people. Now people are the dominant driving factor, forcing factor that's, that's, interact, that's driving interactions and energy transfer and stuff on these coral reefs. And while we still have some of these interactions, these interactions are by and large weaker. The dominant one are humans. That's coral reefs. Here's kelp forests. So in kelp forests, what we tend to do is we tend to remove the apex predator, things like black sea bass, things like uh, the sheep's head right here in the picture on the right. Um, you know, again, these are tasty things. These are, these are desirous things. So we, over, we, we target those guys first. So we knock down those guys. Let's say we knock down the herbivore population. And then because the herbivores are gone, the grazers, like the urchins, go crazy and go explosive. And their populations go crazy. They get super abundant. They start to nub down the kelp. And now we have less kelp. And that kelp is incredibly important, just like the coral reefs providing this structure. It's, it's a, a keystone species, if you will, in these ecosystems. And then when we lose the kelp, we see a reduction in the diversity and the trophic complexity and all that kind of stuff. And generally speaking, the ecosystem is relatively degraded. So we see that um, happening uh, over and over again. In the case of our story here, um, in the in the our part of the Pacific, uh, actually this first part here, this is up in Alaska in that area. But our, these kelp forest ecosystems arose at least 20 million years ago. So way before humans were actively living in Alaska and Canada and Washington State and that, that kind of area. We had abundant sea otters at the time. So these sea otters are doing their due. These sea otters love to eat urchins. And so they would keep the urchin population somewhat under control, right? If the urchins started becoming super abundant, then the sea otters that would eat urchins and other things would switch to the urchins and eat the, eat the urchins and knock their populations down. And in effect, keeping them from being in an explosive and in, in a very hyper abundant population state. About 2,500 years ago, we start to see extensive aboriginal hunting um, as our ancestors start to hunt the sea otters primarily for their pelts because they, they're very dense fur and so they're really good to keep us warm. So we start to knock the sea otter populations down, but only a little bit. I mean, we definitely had an impact, but relatively, um, uh, there's still a lot of sea otters around. And then in come the Russians. Thanks, Russians, who come in um, as fur traders. And so they go in and they either themselves actively trap or they pay the, the native peoples in the area uh, for large numbers of pelts. And so it amounts to the same thing, doesn't matter who did it. And we, we drive down the populations of our sea otters to near extinction levels. And so we see the sea urchin populations going up, sea urchin populations going up, they mow down the kelp forests and therefore our kelp forest diversity goes down. The biomass on the, on the kelp reefs go down. Um, in the U.S., we've protected sea otters since 1972 with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. You guys already heard a little bit about that. And pretty much since then, we've seen sea urchin populations decline as the sea otter population has recovered. And concomitantly, our kelp forests have improved. And we see more abundant, more diverse kelp beds. Here in Southern California, we see a, a pretty similar story. In general, our kelp reef ecosystems were much more diverse than those in the, up in the closer towards the Arctic. So we have more species of fish, more species of invertebrates, etc. Same thing, those, those Russian fur traders got down here too. And so they um, uh, knocked down our sea otter populations. But here's the deal. We had so, our, our ecosystems were so much more diverse, we had things other than the sea otters keeping those herbivores in control. So even though the sea otter population took a hit down here in Southern California, 
the the kelp forest didn't really collapse uh, at least at least not in the 1800s what happens ooh all that technology comes in thanks to world war ii and we see all kinds of better scuba activity um, where people can stay underwater and 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 do all kinds of harvesting so long story short we take out the lobster the abalone the sheephead that are important um that, that are important guys there. And then we also see, especially here, as the population explodes after World War II, and we're dumping a lot of our raw sewage straight off into the ocean, that pollution causes a lot of problem, degrades the water quality, makes light more difficult, uh, less able to penetrate down and sustain these photosynthetic critters that are giant kelp. And so the kelp forests decline. And in this case, uh, it wasn't until we see the explosion of the sea urchin fishery, which starts because we nuked the, the abalone fishery. So the fishermen switch to a different species. They switch to sea urchins. They start taking the sea. So abalone, if abalone populations become abundant, abalone sit in place and they wait for the sloughed off kelp frond to fall onto them and then they eat it. Urchins are different. Urchins are active grazers. Urchins come out of their cracks every night, out of their homing scars, and they go and they, and if they're ravenous, they'll just go and mow stuff down. So they'll actively go to the kelp and they'll munch it so much, they'll essentially munch the, the hold fast away and it'll float off. Um, so it, it actually took the active harvesting of the herbivores for us to get their numbers down such that we could see the beginnings of the recovery of these kelp forest ecosystems. So again, just like we saw with the offshore uh, critters, here, here's, here's a diagram of our kelp forests beforehand. Uh, excuse me, but before we, we over harvested or before we started intensively fishing the ecosystem and then after, again, the difference, people. People are major um, predators, if you will, in these systems. Um, yep, and so uh, in the Gulf of Maine, the only difference between us and the Gulf of Maine, this is not where we were, but um, these guys had, uh, had sea minks, which are kind of like our sea otters in the sense that they were targeted for their fur. And these guys um, were hunted to extinction by somewhere around 1894-ish, somewhere in that order of magnitude and these guys um but, but, but it amounts, amounts to the same thing right it amounts to like like taking out these focal key parts of the ecosystem and then the ecosystem changes we could talk about seagrass beds the same way so we take out these large herbivores in the case in, in this case it could be something like manatees or dugongs um uh so we remove these guys the seagrass becomes much more dense and it becomes more dense and actually that tends to lead to poorer water quality. The water doesn't flush through as much. We tend to get more um, epi epibionts, things living on the fronds and it gets kind of skanky and, and all kinds of problems. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, so poor water quality feeds into this and ultimately we get mass die-offs in these areas. In the estuaries, same thing. So the, the best studied one in the context of this discussion is from Chesapeake Bay on the East Coast. And here these guys um, were dominant, the, these ecosystems dominated by oysters. Anybody know who John James, uh, James Audubon was? Man, I can't talk today. He started the Audubon, well, yeah, he basically started the Audubon. He's the inspiration for the Audubon Society. He wrote The Birds of North America, which is the first real modern sort of natural history tome that was designed to interpret uh, organisms for people. He's a fantastic artist as well as natural historian. It's a whole long story about him. But suffice it to say, he, he, he took his family around the U.S. to make his, to make his, uh, folio to make his book and make his paintings for his book of all the birds of North America. He spent time off Louisiana. When he first went uh, off the mouth Mississippi, went to the west side, the ship almost crashed. It was, the hull was almost destroyed by these reefs of 
oysters, these basically rocky reefs of li living rocky reefs. When he goes back a couple decades later, he goes to the same spot, the ship sails right on through, no problem. Similar stories happening in Chesapeake Bay here. Some of the oysters back in the day were the size of dinner plates. Let me say that again, size of dinner plates. The oysters that we get now, if we're lucky to get some big size ones, are more like the size of our hand. And sometimes if you go to some places, bastards charge you the same amount of money and they're like the size of your, you know, knuckle. You're like, oh, sorry. You're like, wait, dude, this is an oyster? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so what's going on here is we're, you know, oyster, is that really all important? The estimates are that, okay, never, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so suffice it to say, what's going on here is um, we lose the suspension feeders of this ecosystem and that leads to eutrophication. That leads to too much nutrient, uh, in, too many nutrients in the system. So we think it went something like this. So this is, this is a whole ecological debate and it just it bores me to death. It's so stupid. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not stupid, but it's so, it's so locked in academia. But this notion of bottom up versus top down. Can somebody ex tell me the definition of bottom up versus top, top down from your ecology class? Just remind, me what, remind us what that means. Bottom up versus top down control. Right. Right. So the question is, why do we have so many of critter X? Is it because there's lots of food for critter X to eat, or by, or you know the opposite is there's not enough food for for critter X to eat? Right. So we'd call that coming from the quote unquote bottom of the food web, bottom up. Right? And that th those factors are primarily dictating the abundance of this critter. The other, the other possible explanation is a so-called top-down. So that is, there's so many predators eating critter X that their abundance is being held low. Or we killed all the predators, and so the, the lack of predators is why critter X can get so abundant. Everybody with me? Okay, so the original hypothesis we had uh, for why our estuaries, say, in the Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere, are so eutrophied or have such a problem with too many nutrients and algal blooms and poor water quality and stuff, um, was that uh, we're, we're pumping in too many nutrients into the ecosystem, right? And so that's what's going on. We're putting too, ma too, many fer too much fertilizer on, on the crops nearby and stuff. But increasingly, we've, uh, what's, what's uh, new evidence that's come to light is this notion of top-down being responsible for this ecosystem decline. And so that starts with mechanical harvesting of these oysters and other things, but, but especially oysters. There was, the estimates are there were so many oysters in Chesapeake Bay that the entire volume of the bay was filtered once a day, meaning all that water went through at least one, on average, went through at least one oyster every day. What do those oysters do? They filter feed, they get stuff, and then the stuff they don't eat, they basically poop out. So they convert stuff in the water column to sediment. They essentially um, um, put that stuff from floating to attached on the benthos. So they're fantastic water cleaners, water filterers, right? Literally filter feeders. And so, and so the fact that we lose these guys um, we're allowing more of these materials to stay in suspension and essentially be eutrophied in the, the water body to be eutrophied. Does that make sense? Now, as with most of these silly debates, probably both these things are going on, both top down and bottom up. But until we looked at the historical record, we didn't really appreciate that, that the so-called top down forcing factors could be what's going, what's going on. There's all kinds of secondary effects, but this is what these systems used to look like. Right? There's no mud flats here, or there's very little mud flat here. All the available mud flat space is covered with living reef, oyster reef. Now, there's other complicating factors here, um, uh, such as when we harvest these oysters back in the day, we'd pull the oysters out and throw them away, and, and the oyster shells themselves, even the dead oysters, form the basis for the where the babies can recruit 
where the larvae can recruit for the next year. So there's all kinds of other complicating factors that we were messing with this stuff. But clearly these factors um, uh, matter. And so again, just like we saw before, we started with this type of food web uh, situation and we progressed to this one where humans are dominating. And increasingly, this is what we see in the world's, the world's near shore waters. On the lower left, that's what we're farming. Microbes, more and more slime, more and more bacteria. Not to slander slime, slime's cool and all, but I'm just saying, right? We're, we're not only, we're getting to the point where we're losing critters and so we're shifting these systems a lot of times to microbial based ecosystems, much more so than uh, they were before. Okay, and the last one I can tell people are getting burnt out. Last one here, we'll just talk about the continental shelves um, and what's going on there. Here, uh, overfishing for commercially important species like cod, like halibut, uh, etc. We were we've been fishing, for example, the area off the Georges Banks off the East Coast. We've been fishing these areas for hundreds and hundreds of years, and and having an impact. But people were still able to fish up until we get these new technological innovations that allow us to put more fishing pressure more continuously on these ecosystems. And so we get stories like, so this, this image here is Atlantic cod on, on the lower image. And again, we see a relatively stable harvest. And then we hit the post-World War II period. And oh my god, boom, the spikes, right? The, the landings, the catch goes way up. And then it collapses. And so this is what we've seen on, in terms of ecosystem collapse in all these areas, right? Gulf of Maine, Caribbean, Chesapeake. It doesn't matter what our critters are, whether we're talking about oysters or coral or cod. It's a similar story of ecosystem collapse when we really start to, over, when we start to harvest intensely. And so this appear this this is a postulated this is from that um, from that Jackson paper but this is the postulated story so uh, throughout throughout history there's more and more people and we're having all these secondary impacts but but Jackson and his colleagues postulate that we start with overfishing that's always the start of the decline of these ecosystems and then we enter this era of pollution and then some type of mechanical physical disturbance of the ecosystem, introduced non-native species, exotic species, invasive species, and then we cap it off in recent years with global scale climate change, and all of that is driving our altered ecosystems. And the, these altered ecosystems are then in turn susceptible to all kinds of secondary other impacts and and all this other stuff. It's important to note that we're increasingly understanding that these changes can happen very quickly, potentially. Very quickly. So uh, what you might refer to as an alternative stable state or crossing a threshold where we can see radical changes quite quickly. One of the hypotheses some folks have suggested is that if we have intact ecological communities, the speed of the, we, we couldn't see rapid change as fast. So intact ecosystems might have a buffering ability to resist rapid change. But as we pull apart members of the ecosystem, when we do have these other assaults, climate change, pollution, whatever, we make the system vulnerable to potentially rapid change. And, and Oh, also, just to finish up, a lot of this we now are increasingly understanding is synergistic. So it's not additive, but it's, it's synergistic and that, that is leading to interactions that we couldn't have predicted or we didn't predict beforehand. And so then um, uh, we'll, we'll pause here. But so to add to what we've seen before, overfishing may be one of the primary causes of marine ecosystem collapse. It may be necessary. In other words, if we, if we had an intact coral reef and we just added in climate change, the climate change would be bad, but we may not see the, in, the entire collapse of the, of the reef. 
So it, it, it may have started with overfishing, or at least overfishing might be necessary to set up the stage for rapid ecosystem change. And then, of course, overfishing uh, consequences highly the importance of diversity overall. Cool?